evening and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We're glad you could join us as we answer all of those gardening questions. If you've got a question you need answering, you can just dial 1-800-676-5446 and talk to our phone volunteers. You can also submit pictures and questions for a future show. Email us at byf at unl.edu. Do tell us where you live and let us know what's going on in your landscape. You should also check out all our past shows and our features on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. Follow us during the week on Facebook. So let's get going with samples, Jody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we all know what's coming up here, audience. <laughs> so in Nebraska, May is our tickiest month. And so I brought some ticks. You can see in this container here, I've got an assortment of American dog ticks, which are pretty common today, and they're in all areas. So rural, suburban, and urban, anywhere that there is wildlife or grass, mice, deer, so it's kind of everywhere. Um, I just wanna remind people to treat their pets and check for ticks, because when they do get attached, they look uh, like this. <laughs> so these are the same type of ticks, but they've been engorged because they were feeding and removed from a dog. Um, they were probably feeding for about seven days. So, yeah. So I just want to remind you, check yourself, your children, and your pets. Have them treated because if they're treated by medication by the veterinarian, the ticks will die if they're feeding on a treated pet. Um, remove with pointy tweezers and always keep that tick. Take a picture so we can have it identified in case there's any adverse reactions like a fever or anything. You can tell your doctor that you were bitten by a tick. And look for those little bitty tiny, like, seed. Yeah, I call it like fact-checking your freckles. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> okay, thanks, Joey. All right, Terry, really you're in the... if you got a lot of freckles. <laughs> <they're looking for laughs> okay, Terry, you're in the turf chair again, and you have a weed that went from zero to 12 inches in, like, a day. I do. So this is um, common chickweed. So this one is actually one that we weren't <clears throat> seeing until it got warm and now we are seeing it quite a bit. But this is one that is a winter annual, so it uh, seeded itself and started growing last winter, um, kind of sat there all winter long, and now has emerged and is very happy. Very simple to pull, use a hula hoe or just pull it out. Um, easy to take care of, don't let, to go, don't let it go to flower. Um, if you do have it persistent year year round or year after year in the same place, you can put a pre-emergent down like in September because that's when it's going to germinate. And true confessions, that is in my front yard. And yes, it already flowered <coughs> and seeded just when I blinked. Then put some pre-emergent down <laughs> no, in September. No, just mowing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Lauren, we have the ends well, of a tree. Well, I have a, a wilty uh, branch <laughs> off of a flowering crab apple tree. Uh, but this time of year is usually when we uh, start to see scab showing up in our flowering crab apples. Uh, you can see here, I've just got one small lesion. The leaf has just started a little bit on the edge and curling a little bit. Uh, many times this time of year, though, this is a tree in my landscape that I would have a lot of scab, but it has been so dry earlier mm. uh, that now with the recent rains, though, the thing I wanted to show everyone is these little guys here that are fruit mummies, and these were infected with scab last year. And if you see, they're all kind of shriveled up and they look scabby and they're producing millions of spores that are then going out and will cause more infection with our higher humidity and moisture in the air. So should see more coming on, but this is the time of year. Also, people are selecting trees, so make sure you're getting resistance to our common diseases. Scab uh, is one of them, as well as cedar apple rust if we're in any of the trees that are in the flowering crab apples or apple trees. All right, and it varies across the state for resistance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, thank you, Lauren. Elizabeth. So what we have is a really fun peony, not an anemone, a peony. Um, but what it is, is this is a fern leaf peony, and the reason it's called a fern leaf is because it has a very dissect leaf on it, so it's very fine. Um, it's anemone 
um, style bloom, which means it's a single, um, and it's got that nice uh, dark pink color on it. it this is Sweetie. Um, it's one of the very early ones to bloom, and it likes that part shade to shaded environment, but it is one that um, does really well. It's really interesting, um, especially after it gets done flowering too, so it does add a little bit of extra interest in the landscape as well, but this is one of the fern leaf peonies. And the nice thing about those anemone flowered is those flower heads are not so big that in the rain or the wind, they don't go like that. So excellent. All right. Nice job on the samples, except for your weirdness. <laughs> okay. You get the very first insect question. And this first one is just amazing, Jody. So this is in Lincoln and uh, it is this swarm was in a neighbor's tree in Lincoln. It, yeah, that's what an, are we going to say a massive about it? Swarm. It looks yeah. kind of like a sloth when I first saw it. <laughs> but yeah, honeybees typically swarm here in Nebraska, like uh, April and May. And this is just how like the honeybee hive will reproduce. Sometimes they're they're overcrowded or they're escaping unfavorable conditions, but they don't last long like this. A beekeeper would love to come and get that if if possible, um, but otherwise, if you kind of leave it alone, it will end up. Just go Kind away. of going, yeah, because right now, or if that was out there, they're looking for a new place to live. And so they're not aggressive at that time. It's very, very cool. We had a conversation about, does it look like a bear? Does it look like a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> that's a big one. It's a yeah, dinosaur that's huge. foot. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jody. Your second one here is, um, this is out in Mitchell. And she saw this on the west side of her house, chilling in the morning shade by raspberries and strawberries and she wonders what this is and is it a good guy or a bad guy? Um, it's a stonefly. I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's, it's nymph is aquatic and they usually come to porch lights. So if she had a, a light on, um, it wouldn't be a problem for your uh, strawberries okay. or raspberries. So it's a fly. I would say it's probably a good guy. Good guy, all right. Your next one comes to us from a farm south of Fremont and they want to know what this insect is, and is this a good one or a bad one? Okay, so this is a crane fly. Um, they often look like giant mosquitoes, but they do not feed on blood. And sometimes they're called mosquito hawks because people think they feed on mosquitoes, but they don't do that either. So some crane flies as larvae are passive turf. Mm. So when it comes to bugs, like it could be good or bad, depending on what life stage and what situation. I would say that one's a pretty good guy as an adult. <laughs> Most of us are pretty good as adults, right? Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you have one more question, Jody. Um, this is a viewer in Lincoln, mm -hmm. has two ant colonies in the lot next to the house. He's uncomfortable or he wonders, you know, how close can they be to the home? They do kill the grass. Each <clears throat> spot's about a foot square. He doesn't think they're carpenter ants. No, those are field ants. They can make pretty big mounds and, you know, like, I don't know, like two, three feet. Um, but they don't normally come into your house if that's what you're worried about. If you're worried about your own yard, uh, I mean, you can treat that, but you would want to rake away, dig deep down, and then treat with the labeled insecticide. But you've got to get to the colony down below. So if it's not your yard, I'm not sure that that's something you would want to do, but keep an eye on it so it doesn't get to your yard. All right, thanks, Jody. All right, Terry, uh, your first one comes to us uh, actually north of Mullen in Cherry County. Uh, they have a garden fenced and chicken wire on the bottom to keep the good things in, the bad things out. They, but they, uh, they're really getting kind of tired of trying to deal with the weeds along the bottom of this panel fence. They have used uh, annual rye as a winter cover crop. <laughs> the deer have kept that trim. They also <laughs> ate the rhubarb. <laughs> so she, she's tired of shoveling. She wants to know what to do. Um, well, really what I would do is I would go get mulch and I would just start mulching this. Um, I think that they said that they were planting peas and some of those plants to crawl up this fence and planting some flowers. So go get some mulch and mulch that. That's actually gonna help improve um, the plants also in the long run. So two inches of either grass clippings, if you know what you put on your grass, or wood mulch would be work just fine. All right, excellent, thanks, Terry. You have two pictures for this next one. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is a Columbus viewer. 
Uh, every year they have trouble getting turf to grow in these areas, and one spot has <coughs> 30 to 40 foot tall oaks and several pines. The other is under a maple tree. <laughs> They've tried sod, grass seed, fertilizer, water, aeration, everything. Should they wait till fall and kill and start over? They don't have underground irrigation. Um, well, if this was my yard, I, this would now become a landscape bed. Mm -hmm. So I would be looking for shrubs or herbaceous um, perennials that live in like the shade. You could go with like some vinca or something for like a ground cover. Um, some hostas would look really nice in there. You're gonna have enough shade. Um, you could go with some a um, little bit taller um, shrubs or something but it would become a landscape bed. You'd have a nice little walking path through there because it looked like you had a gate. So that's what I would do with it. In other words, it's not turf happy. It is not turf happy. Trees and turf um, sometimes don't like each other and trees usually win. <laughs> All right, thanks. Unless you have a chainsaw. Unless you have a chainsaw. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, your first one is Lauren, four pictures. And uh, this is a Fuji apple tree. They have apples and pears, uh, three Fujis, 2014. It's along an edge. They get the same care every year. The, the, the one in question is that one in the middle there, a yielded weaker. This, the middle one is very slow to leaf out. A lot of flowers. He uses a, a fruit tree spray. pH is about 6.4. And he's got, I think, one here that shows a little bitty branch, too. He's, he's wondering, what hmm. is this disease-based? Is this environmental just in that one spot? What do you think yeah, so here? This branch, if we focus in, and right there where it's, it's bent, there's a swelling. Um, that may be an indication of what's going on. Anytime we see trees that are all similar age and we have one that starts turning color, particularly, and this can be in shrubs or anything, if we see color change early, if we see slow leaf out, uh, in the spring, um, you know, heavier reproductive attempts, uh, the tree's dying usually. So unfortunately, um, <laughs> this is one that, that I, would, I would think about just going ahead and, and, and replacing. Um, you're not gonna be able to do anything to treat it and it's most likely some sort of a canker or it could be something that, that came in on the stock. It's really hard to tell with these. Uh, there's a lot of fungi that look for any type of stressed tree, so. Um, unfortunately, can't really tell you to do something with that that's going to save it. All right. Thank now that you. said, maybe it'll be the best tree you got next year. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it's usually how it goes sometimes, but I doubt it. All right. <laughs> uh, you have one more with two pictures. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is a, a tree in Lincoln started looking like this a few years ago. It is a maple. This past spring looked like it was sweating, leafing out. It's got shedding bark. He's wondering, is this bacterial wet wood or something yeah, else? Can we go back to the previous picture? I don't know if it's possible to do that, if they can hear me. Um, you can kind of see that dark, and you see that streak <coughs> running down from that area of the crotch uh, in the tree there. Uh, a lot of times what we'll have in that space is uh, you may have a crack or something where you start getting uh, some debris, uh, something that uh, a microorganism can start growing on. Uh, usually some sort of yeast will get in there. It may start fermenting. Uh, and then you'll you'll even have we'll have people say that their tree is hissing uh, if their cavity is large enough, uh, but it will ooze out then you know some of those exudates and run. Uh, this can also be from in the spring a crack in that crotch that is sap just being pressed up and, and run down the tree. So uh, depending on what it is, if you see any foaminess with it, it, it could be described as wet wood. Uh, if it's just in the spring and you're seeing that sap, uh, I would just look for it as potential for a hazard tree that could be cracked and part of that branch could fall off and, and cause some damage if it's close to a building. It also looked like that branch was awfully large in comparison yeah. to the trunk. Yeah, and when yeah. you see that, so just you know, be careful with balance. Uh, uh, look at it for the potential to uh, damage some sort of structure if it's close. All right, thank you, Lauren. Elizabeth, your first one, um, you have three pictures here. This is a, a viewer up north, and, uh, and she has rhubarb, and she <laughs> says it has started to flower and is pretty much overrun with, with the flowers already. It's, I mean, it's, it's a very historic planting. She has a great story associated with it, which we really love, and uh, she's wondering what she can do to make sure that this rhubarb stays Healthy, mm -hmm. exactly, 
Right. So with a rhubarb, what we want to do is we want to remove those flower stalks. We don't want that plant to put all that energy and effort into producing flowers and seeds. Um, I know she said she amended some soil around there. She also left the leaves on there um, from the previous year. So we really want to make a good environment. We don't want pathogens, sorry, Lauren, but we don't want <laughs> pathogens in there. And so we really want to clean up around that. We want to make sure that we don't leave those um, leaves at the that when they start to you know, fail and fall and, and leave them in that location, we wanna clean that up. Um, I know we amended. Um, you can also use some different fertilizers and things like that, like a water-soluble fertilizer around the base of that to make sure that that plant is overall and healthy um, and just make sure that they have that adequate amount of sunlight um, and things like that. I think a majority of them looked really healthy. There was that one that I'm kind of questioning and I'd keep my eye on that little one um, just to make sure that we don't have any pathogens getting started in there that will spread through the rest of them. I saw and some my pathogens are trying to win on that one. I bet they are. <laughs> and I saw some rhubarb in Lincoln just driving up here that is already completely flowered out in the heat. Mm -hmm. So all right you have one more question Elizabeth and this is Omaha what is this plant? We will cover it at the plant of the week. Um, <laughs> it's one of the shade loving perennials called critalis. Mm -hmm. It's a, yeah, we'll cover it we'll in cover it greater in detail. We'll cover it later. <laughs> well, this weekend, you should check out a local arts festival at Holy Trinity Church. There will be some gorgeous flower and plant displays, and for our first feature tonight, we thought we'd give you a little preview of what to expect when you attend. We have seven florists coming to fill that church with flowers. They will decorate various portions of the church in what I can only describe as a, a Rose Bowl quality flower festival. They've chosen a theme this year, which is gardens around the world. So use your imagination and envision just how lovely that can be. There will be flowers filling that church. The flower show will be going on all day. Come anytime, come visit, come see. It is something to behold for the gardener. So we're pretty excited to uh, be part of this project that Holy Trinity is putting on. Uh, what we're doing is uh, building different places in the church. They've chosen six areas in the church to enhance with flowers. We're doing gardens from around the world. And so we've picked uh, different countries to do some representation of different types of flowers that would grow in, in that area and different types of styles. Well, it's quite a large festival. They have several artists that are coming. Some are well known, like Joel Sartori and Susan Pels. Um, they're, the floral part of it is Gardens of the World. And the area that I am doing, obviously, since I'm a master of Japanese ikebana, is the Japanese garden, which is going to be more of a memorial type arrangement since my space is in the columbarium. So in Japan, the very saddest flowers are colored white. So my arrangement will reflect that. It will have white flowers, all white flowers in it. We have invited 20 visual artists to come, set up their booths, display and sell their art. We've invited three food trucks to provide sustenance. And we have Zipline Brewery, who's gonna provide a beer garden. Those elements will combine to invite you the patron to come and participate with the artists, have beverage and have food. But we're also gonna fill the church. We have nine performances scheduled throughout the day. That includes a flute duet. There's two dance troupes. We have two organ recitals. We have a Japanese drum troupe that's gonna perform. There is a jazz trio and on top of that, ending the day, a concert pianist. All of those performances can be seen as far as the schedule on our website, holytrinityartsfestival.com. Pretty awesome. So that will be this Saturday, 10 to five here in Lincoln. And we thought it was really fun to combine all those wonderful things into all the beauty of everything we do, including rots and spots on occasion, Lauren. All the time. All the time. All right, <laughs> Jody, your first two pictures are uh, one here of a magnolia Planted last spring, uh, in the fall, she did trim off the branches with leaves that had spots. It's in full sun. This year, she thinks it has scale. 
leaves are curling, changing color. She wants to know what to do. Okay, so if it's magnolia scale, and I couldn't tell if there's like the white large scales, if it's pretty young and you can take, like remove or lightly scrub off some of those scales, you can do that. But the time for treatment's gonna be later in the fall, so it's normally around September. Uh, but you'll want to treat when there's crawlers. And so that's going to be when they're tiny and when they're mobile. And you can use horticultural oil for that or insecticidal soap. All right. Your next two are from Papillion. And um, this is a weeping cherry started to leaf out. She saw these round holes in the new leaves. Is it an insect? Is it pathological? Is it environmental? It's always hard to tell, I know. Yeah, this one's really hard to tell. I don't think it's insect damage, so I'll ask my <laughs> analyst what you think, Warren. I, I really think it, it actually might be nutritional uh, just when it came out in the spring because nothing really disease-wise that looks mm -hmm. like that. So. Maybe moisture availability if it's in a landscape with that it was drier. Mm -hmm. And again, you just sort of watch these new plants yeah, yeah, and yeah. see what they do. And one or two holes is mm -hmm. one or two holes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was no consistent pattern there that I saw, Jody. That I right. think it was a disease. Okay, so mm -hmm. all right, to do about it. All right, uh, Terry, your first one here is from Gosper County, south of Elwood. Pulled this from soil in a flower bed that <laughs> they got. Uh, the dirt out of a dry corral. Succulents grow there. She doesn't water, but whatever this is, she doesn't want it. Well, it looks like you're doing the right thing. You pulled it out. This is Western Salsify. It's kind of a cool, it's in the Asteraceae family. Uh, gets this really big seed head that's like huge, like an oversized uh, dandelion on steroids. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Just pull it. Yeah, pull them up. Yep. All right, your next two are uh, sort of a follow-up from a previous show. And this is a Hastings viewer who is, who is worried about all of these various grasses that are encroaching in his buffalo grass. We asked him for some additional pictures. Uh, you have two here that are this. What do we think this is and how do you manage it? So this was in buffalo grass and I'm <coughs> pretty sure this is mostly um, tall fescue growing in this. Um, they are opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to cool season, warm season. Um, I do believe he said he tried to treat with glyphosate already. Um, you need to wait till the buffalo grass goes dormant and you're most likely going to have to do that this fall and you will, um, treat and make sure that when you're treating, you are treating when the temperatures are above 60 degrees. Yeah. So that I think is kind of one of the problems that might have happened with it not getting treated correctly, so. And, and he has tried a whole bunch of stuff, weed beater for broadleaf dimension, yep. et cetera, so. All right, thank you, Terry. Uh, you have one more picture. This is Norfolk. They have a section of turf that has a fine bladed lime green grass. They, they fertilize regularly and they do wonder why it's this color and there is an ash next door or nearby. <laughs> well, I'm usually if it's if it looks different, then most likely it's gonna be a different grass. So I couldn't tell it wasn't close enough to be able to give you an ID. Uh, most likely um, one of the other reasons it could possibly be is that there is some kind of nutrient deficiency and it could be nutrient deficient because the tree is decomposing or some, you know, some decomposing and the nitrogen is getting tied up in the soil. So that could be a possibility. Um, what I would do is in the fall, probably overseed with the, the kind of turf you want and just try to start blending it in. All right, thank you, Terry. All right, Lauren, uh, this is a viewer with a bee balm, so a Monarda and uh, she says this one's looking a bit yellow and others are as well. This is the only picture she sent, so we don't have context yeah, here. So if, if you look at this, all the new growth is yellow. So a lot of times when we see this, when our plants are leafing out, this is a good a symptom of a virus mm -hmm. uh, infection. So uh, that's what I would guess in this case. It may be something that as it heats up, this would go away. A lot of times our viruses can 
um, ex exhibit symptoms in plants. You'll see the, the plant symptoms in cooler temperatures, and then when it warms up, they may go away. So it may be fine, but over time, this will probably succumb to a disease because that'll stress the plant. All right. And you can't really treat it. No, you can't. Avoid but enjoy it while it's there. <laughs> might have really cool leaves for a while. <laughs> and might bloom or not. Yeah. Might All have right. some streaking in it, too. It'd be really cool. <laughs> a new <laughs> selection. Yeah. You have two pictures for this next one. Uh, this is a Hancock, Iowa viewer. Mm -hmm. And why are the hostas growing like this? And I think their concern is really the odd hollow in the middle. And I think your second picture is actually from a different viewer, but it's relatively similar. similar. Yeah, so, uh, you know, and, and, and we see this in all of our perennial plants, right? And even like the rhubarb earlier, uh, you could relate to this, that, that these plants many times will get crowned root rots that will over time build up. And, and sometimes the plant just dies out in the center, like in a hosta like that, you'll have just the center part dying out as the new growth comes out and it keeps going. So many times you need to just refresh those. And so, you know, digging them up, cleaning it out, you know, moving them around where you get more central growth and then that comes out. And as far as time of year to dig up hosta and move them, probably looking more fall, would that be right, Elizabeth? So uh, I wouldn't do it now, but this fall maybe doing some maneuver maneuvering and cleaning up and it's gonna help. It's easy when they first start to come up and then move them, because right now, if you're gonna move them, you're gonna have to water them a lot more. Mm -hmm. right. Sometimes it's kind of touch and go if you move them in the fall. Um, okay. You might get success, but if we had a fall like we had last year, you're gonna have to water them a lot. You're gonna have to yeah. water them a lot or they might not survive. <laughs> yeah. So you might give it a try. All right. Gonna have a cool week next week. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, you have four pictures for this first one. This is a Malvern, Iowa viewer, so southwest of Omaha. Acreage, 10 white pine along the property line. Needles are extremely yellow. They don't know what it is. Um, maybe thinking lack of moisture or that the soil is alkaline. And you know, here's kind of the two of the 10. And then I think we have three more pictures on this. So progressively getting closer and closer and closer to the tree. He did say that all the same side of all these trees is that color. So white pine is a species that is really susceptible to winter desiccation or winter drought. Um, so when I took a look at those pictures, the shape of the tree seems a little off. Um, and so when we dig a little closer and we get to that second picture, there's a branch that's extremely low to the ground. And so that also makes me think that there could be a planting depth issue on mm -hmm. top of that. Mm -hmm. So we could have some issues with winter desiccation or winter drying. Um, it's a little early to have some of the needle blights, mm -hmm. but you know, I might take a look um, or send a sample in just to rule that out. But I think we could have a combination of winter desiccation, drought stress, and maybe a planting depth issue kind of all rolled into one with some of those trees. Right, and alkalinity probably, <clears throat> I mean, they don't know if their soil is alkaline, so. Yeah, I mean, a not. soil test is probably gonna be your best bet to determine exactly where right. you're at to know whether or not that's gonna play a role. All right, you have one more picture. Um, this is an Omaha viewer. What is this damage and what can be done about it? And this is a false cypress. So about the only thing you can do on a lot of these evergreens that are showing that winter desiccation or winter death in those areas is to prune the dead out and determine whether or not you're happy with what you're left with. If it's more than one third, that tree or plant's gonna have a hard time overcoming that. Um, if it's less than a third, it might be able to come back out of it, but it's not going to regrow in those dead areas. So you have to kind of take with it what you have and determine whether or not you want to leave it in that current condition or just remove it and replace it. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, some very hot weather has rolled into the eastern part and the western part of the state. It does mean for us, it's going to be time to plant our garden. Let's take a minute to hear from Terry James about what's going on at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're really excited. Things have really dried out after those four plus inches that we've had here in the Lincoln area. So we're excited about getting things going. As you can see, the retaining wall is up and going. The guys are working really hard to get that up and going for us and we're, we'll be able then to plant in our distribution garden. We also have all of our plants out of the greenhouse hardening off. We'll get containers started here this week and then the rest of the garden will go in this weekend and into next week. Just remember if you're planting in containers that you wanna make sure you're using good soil 
and to add that soil release fertilizer to give them food throughout the whole growing season because you want those plants to look really good. We also have some plants kind of flowering a little bit early this year just because of this little bit of heat wave that we've had. So as you can see, the poppies are up and going and the Amsonia is up and going. So lots of things to see in the backyard farmer garden. So stop by and check it out. Right now it is time for the lightning round, which is appropriate because we're hearing some thunder in the studio. Mm -hmm. All right, Elizabeth, um, this is a Gothenburg viewer who has Ogallala strawberries and they have only flowered once. He wonders how to get them to flower and produce fruit, I think more than once a season. You'll have to make sure that they're not, I don't know much about that variety, but whether they're day neutral, June bearing, ever bearing, you know, that middle, that'll make a difference on how often they bloom. All right. Um, this viewer wants to know how do you make a compost pile hot enough to, to break down oak leaves? Chop them up really fine and be sure to make sure that it has 50% moisture. All right. This is an Omaha viewer who wants to know whether the rhubarb that he got is, should be plant the crowns above ground or below ground. Depends on your soil type. Most of the time at, at level would be great. Um, if you have a heavier soil, you might be able to sneak it up a little bit. All right. This is a Lincoln viewer who uh, wants to know either how to keep lily of the valley from spreading or how to kill it. Good luck. <laughs> Move. Um, you, it's, it's tough one to try to control. I mean, you could try solarization, but it's going to continue to move and go. All right. Uh, North Loop viewer wants to know whether trees should still be planted now or wait till fall with the drought. You know, North Loop, I'd do it either way. Um, if you're going to water it now, if you're going to plant it now, make sure it has plenty of water. Um, otherwise, wait till fall and then you don't have to water for quite as long. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. That should not count. That was after the buzzer. Okay. <laughs> Come on. I got to represent North Loop. Come on. <laughs> and who would get rid of Lily of the Valley? They're so pretty. <laughs> A lot of people. Throw it in a bucket. <laughs> All right. Lauren, are you ready? I'm ready as a fried bologna sandwich on Little Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Wood River viewer who, won, who says, is it possible to already have powdery mildew showing up in their choke cherries? Anything's possible, but that's unlikely. All right. So the follow-up question then is, what could it be if it's silvery spots on the leaves? Silvery spots, it's really unusual that, to, that you would have powdery mildew. Um, I'd want to see a picture of that one. All right. Um, this viewer <laughs> wonders whether topsoil that smells terrible would spread a rod of some sort in the garden? Mm, not necessarily. A lot of things uh, smell terrible that are really beneficial. I mean, there's cow manure. <laughs> OK. <laughs> this is a, a carny viewer who had ash bolites last year. Oh, nice. Should they expect to get them again? Oh, uh, real good chance, yeah. Get the pruner out. All right. Uh, David City uh, viewer said the interior needles of their spruce are dead from some disease. Is it time to treat spruce for something? Mm, it depends. There's a lot of different needle cast diseases, and they all cycle at different times. I would recommend submitting a sample for that. All right. Excellent. Nice job. I did mine within the time and got five. You <laughs> that was all right, all right, Terry, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Uh, this is a viewer who said they mowed Monday at the requisite three and a half inches height, and it's already six inches tall on Thursday, and they didn't fertilize. Did the mowing stimulate the growth? <laughs> um, no, that would have been the rain that we've get, been getting and the heat. All right. Um, this is an Omaha viewer who wonders whether it is too late to put down a pre-merge for crabgrass? This is their first one. Uh, probably. Um, you'll probably have to put a post-emergent like pentamethylin on it. All right. This is a Pickerel, Nebraska viewer who got seeds of frosted explosion, which was one of the grasses you had last mm -hmm. year. It's rich Ready? grass and wonders if it's invasive. No. Nope. All right. Uh, this is dandelions in a 30-year-old uh, bunch of roses. How to get rid of them without spraying. This oh, is Bellevue. Go get some heavy gloves and a soil knife and just start digging. All right. This is a Howells viewer who wonders if you pick off the flowers of dandelions before they seed, will the seed still ripen and spread? No. All right. How do you kill bindweed? Uh, keep at it all year long. <laughs> nice job.
Good, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good job, Carrie. <laughs> All right, the gauntlet's thrown. I, I never win. I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay. <laughs> All right, Jody. Your first one, uh, this is a Seward viewer who and this just came in today, said that they were outside and there's some sort of invisible insect that is biting them. What might that be? How do you know it's an insect biting you? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. I don't either. I guess I'll pass. All right. <laughs> so this is a Lions viewer who wants to know neem oil is used for what? Well, there's some products that have like, uh, it's like a fungicide and a something else and an insecticide, but it's used like it is an organic product usually for like food. All right. An Omaha viewer wants to know uh, when to control a grubs to control the Japanese beetles. Are we in the window? Well, it depends. If you have turf issues and there are grubs in the turf above the threshold limits you can treat in like June or July. Mm -hmm. All right. Is there an insecticidal soap that will work for borers in lilac and viburnums? No. All right. Is there a repellent for ticks? This is an Omaha viewer. Um, I would use permethrin treated clothing. Excellent. Nice job all. So somebody won the yeah, an actual lightning Represent round. Represent the turf chair. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, let's let her bask in her lightning laurels and mm -hmm. you can talk we'll about We'll just pay attention over here. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> what we have this week is two very nice plants of the week. Um, we'll start with the kind of periwinkle colored one. Um, what this is, is this is a phlox, and this is the native phlox. So it's a little different than some of the other ones that we have that get the powdery mildew and all those issues. Um, this one does not get that. Uh, it's slow to colonize, and it has a really sweet smell to it. Um, it's one of the woodland ones, so it likes that shaded environment. Um, the other one I said we would get to later in the show, and here it is. Um, this is Corridalis. Um, Corridalis is a part shade perennial. Um, it will seed itself, but it's not an aggressive seeder. Um, it's one of those nice uh, ones that seeds itself and kind of colonizes. It's got a long bloom time. Um, so it's going to continue to bloom for about oh, 12 weeks or so. So that's the good part with this one is it provides that yellow spot to the shade, helps to lighten that area up, um, and it has an extended bloom time. So two very nice plants of the week this week. And just to uh, head off a question from people who have the other corridalis that is yellow that is a weed, this is not the yellow one that is the weed. This is the nice one. This is the nice one. <laughs> All right, uh, Jody, you have three pictures for this one. Uh, this is a viewer in Grand Island who has three large ash trees breaking bud. He has heard there is a ground treatment that can be applied under ash to take up to protect them from emerald ash borer. Can you explain this? Is this correct? Okay. And can homeowners do this themselves? Okay, so there, that is one of the three treatments that can be done. So there's trunk injection, there's like a bark spray, and then there's a ground treatment. Ground treatment can be done by homeowners. However, the success or the effectiveness depends on the size of the tree and also like the percent defoliation or the health of the tree. So if there's less than 50% defoliation, you can do that if your tree at breast height is 15 inches or less. Mm -hmm. So if they are rather large trees that it sounds like he may have, that's not gonna be effective. So you may have to go with an arborist, but you'd want to evaluate your trees and the health of the tree to determine if that is the best course of action for the ash trees. And right. they should contact their local extension <laughs> office and talk to their local extension <laughs> educator. In Grand Island. In Grand Island. <laughs> and they will be able to help you to know if that tree is in good condition for treatment. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> All right, you have uh, two questions, uh, two pictures for this next one. This is from Herman, Nebraska. Has a 43-year-old Black Hill spruce that has these insects on them. What are they? How do you kill them? They looked great going into the winter, and after March, they all started losing their needles, like that first picture, and turning brown. 
Okay, so two things. So the insects that are on this picture here, these are dead flies. They've been, um, they have been attacked by an antipathogenic fung fungi, which Lauren would love. It's really cool. <laughs> so they, um, you don't need to kill these flies. They're already dead. As for the trees, so are they. That looks dead too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the fungus killed or winter. Well, it's a different. It yeah. may be a different type of fun fungus or a different. Different fungus, yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting yeah. Mm -hmm. and very dead. Pathogen <laughs> winning on multiple fronts in that picture. <laughs> Amazing. Except winning. for the lightning round. <laughs> All right, Terry, you have uh, two pictures for this one. This is an Omaha viewer. Um, she's, she thought this was sedge and she used sedge hammer on it, but now she's not so sure. She does need to kill it as it's spreading and now flowering. Um, I think this is annual bluegrass, so you can use uh, glyphosate to get rid of this or hand dig it up. It doesn't look like it's in it amongst other turf. It looks like it might be like in a landscape bed or something. They will dig up pretty easy with, they're gonna have a pretty big massive root system, but it'll be shallow so you can use a soil knife to get it out. All right, uh, your next one here, uh, two pictures also. This is a central city viewer. She wonders what this weed is that is growing on the edges of the lawn and the driveway. And she does say it seems to be sort of green all year long, even in the winter. So this is the close up there in the in the rocks. Yeah, so this one, it was hard. I, I went in as close as I possibly could. And I, it's either uh, the annual bluegrass like the last one, or this could be a very small sedge. Um, if you, what you need to do is go down and look at the very bottom. If it's kind of got like a triangle base, then it's a sedge, and then you would need to treat that before the longest day of the season, of the year, and with that sedge hammer that the previous person was trying to use and didn't work. And, and this is a little reminder to our viewers, if you can send us a really, really good picture that's close up, especially of turf or weedy things, that's really helpful. All right. Sedges have edges, rushes are round, grasses are round but have joints. <laughs> That's the song. And apparently we're singing the rest of the show. Yeah. <laughs> it's a musical. Yeah. Make it more right. entertaining. Backyard Farmer the musical. Yeah. We will not make it to 71 seasons. All right, here we go. <laughs> okay, you have two pictures. Uh, this is from Yankton, South Dakota. These circles showed up last year. The dead spot was a circle two years ago, and I think that's your maybe your next picture. They did overseed with bluegrass, mixed grasses, and now they wonder about the, the circles. Uh, a few things going on here. So one is, it, I, I thought almost it looked like maybe a tree was removed mm -hmm. in this space, and then you would have, if it was ground out, you would have those wood chips in there, and, and you would typically get a lot of fungal growth in there, and that fungal growth then will be hydrophobic or water repelling, so you'll have a dead zone there. If there wasn't a tree removed, then it could be just a natural process with something called fairy ring fungi, which these fungi are decomposing thatch. Uh, they produce that green area by breaking down the thatch, it releases nutrients, and then you have a bright green ring. And sometimes they will result in the growth in the center, forming that mycelial mat, which will dry that turf out. So uh, in either way, really breaking that up, if it's the wood chip scenario that you removed a tree, I think I would just let that go a year and just wait and let it break down a little bit more, then try to break it up and do that because you're gonna be fighting it until those wood chips are broken all the way down into you know, basically soil. So um, depending on the scenario there, you can break it up, uh, aerate it heavy, uh, and then overseed it. But I would just be cautious if it is a wood chip scenario and not, not work on it for a year. Excellent, thanks Lauren. Your next you can, one. One thing, you can put nitrogen down, it will help it break down. So if you sprinkle extra nitrogen in that zone, it will help break down the wood chips. All right, your next one is three pictures. This is a Lincoln viewer. Wants to know why is turf dyed in these pockets? One, this two, is, three here. Yeah, this is really a hard one because it looks like it's kind of in that zone between a sidewalk, two sidewalks that could have a lot of different things going on depending. Uh, it could be an area that people walk that you've got some compaction, that you've got traffic issues. Compaction would favor, you know, even some of our early spring root and crown rot infections that we have. Um, I didn't see any ring pattern to the pitcher, so it doesn't look like, you know, for example, you know, necrotic ring spot or something like that, which we would typically see a little bit later in the season. Um, you may want to submit a soil sample, but or not a soil sample, but a, a plant sample. Uh, the other thing is to consider if it is compaction, just to make sure you're heavily aerating that area, trying to break it up and then overseed. 
All right, Elizabeth, you have three pictures here. Uh, this is a grafted dwarf weeping cherry in Omaha, 12 years old. Here's the whole tree. Up until this year, it was good, and now it's sending up sprouts throughout the yard, the last count being around 20. Wonders, should he, uh, what, cut down the tree or get rid of the sprouts? So if you look at the tree, it is no <coughs> longer a weeping cherry tree, so it has reverted. Mm -hmm. um, and so the thing is, is if they're going to remove the tree, they're going to need to cut and do a, a cut stump treatment first, and that will kill the root system and it will kill the little sprouts coming up in the yard. If you don't do that, you will have more sprouts coming up in the yard. All right, your next one is a North Bend viewer that has a year old cherry, has leaves on a branch and two branches without any leaves, cut them off or leave them alone. Cut off the dead, leave what you can on for a while. It's a really young tree and we don't want to do too much heavy pruning on there, but anything dead, damaged and diseased can become uh, taken off. All right, and your final one here is three oaks. They have orange on the bottom of the trunk. What is it? They're called lichens and they're nature's compass. <clears throat> right. They're usually on the north side. Perfect, so no big deal. No big deal. Well, you know, providing a good sample from your yard or garden is really important to be able to get a solution to your problem. Scott Evans and Dana Freeman have put together a few simple tips to make sure they can help you when you bring a sample into your extension office. Spring's finally arrived here in Nebraska and we've been outside in our yards working in the landscape and we may have found some things that we have questions about. Something that's not looking right, something that's growing on your tree or just a plant that just doesn't look healthy. And we wanted to talk to you today about how to bring in a good sample to your local extension office. So Dana, when people are bringing in an insect sample, what should they be doing? So when we bring in an insect sample, we want to be able to see what we're looking at before we open it up. So as you can see here before me, uh, Tupperware containers are a good choice, as are um, empty pill bottles, uh, Ziplocs are a good thing. Just remember in a Ziploc, it's easy to squish a soft bodied insect and we don't want a squished insect. We would like something as intact as possible so we can see all of the insect parts. Um, if you want, if you have damaged wood, that's another thing that you could bring in is a, a piece of damaged wood. Is there anything that we're not able to take a look at? There's quite a few things that we're not able to take a look at. So that would be starting with anything that is liquid um, and that would also include things from the human body. Uh, we are also ab not able to look at insect bites on the skin, and um, that's what a medical doctor does. If someone does see something biting their skin and they're able to get that insect, then we can take a look at it. But, um, you know, we're limited in that as well as we can look at glue traps or glue boards, but we don't want the whole huge thing. They're sticky and messy. A section is good, as well as we don't look at clothing to try to you know, or to any textiles to pull bugs from those. Um, but Scott, do you want to talk a bit about what we want with a turf sample? When it comes to the turf, we want to see the roots and all. We would like a dinner plate size of the sample, half in the good and half in the bad. Some of the mistakes that clients make is that they just go out and pull out some of the grass. We need to see as much of the plant as we're able to. So bring, bring it in, we will give it back to you so that way you can stick it back in the loam. What about weeds in the landscape? When it comes to weeds in the landscape, a photograph is ideal. We could take a good look at that. It really helps if it's in flower. It just really narrows things down. You're welcome to bring in the weeds. Again, bring as much of the plant as you can. Uh, the flowers, the stem, the root if you want to. It just makes the diagnostic process a little bit easier. It also needs to be fresh. We don't want a sample that's been on the dashboard for a couple days. Something that's fresh out of the ground makes it a lot easier for us to work at. So Dana, when it comes to trees and shrubs, what's a good sample for a tree and shrub? I have a sample here of something that is not a good sample. This is a dead twig. And with a, a tree and shrub sample, we like something that's 12 to 18 inches long, has, as you mentioned before, the good and bad components, um, additional photographs of the overall form of trees, how they're planted, lots of, as, as many components as we can see as possible is helpful. 
And when it comes to plants that might have a disease, we want something, again, a fresh sample, and something that represents as much of the plant as possible. So put that in a good, I mean, again, a clear plastic bag so we can take a look at it. We do have limitations that we're not able to diagnose down to maybe an exact pathogen. When it comes to diagnostic diseases, we can narrow it down a lot of times, but if you do need a specific pathogen, we do recommend our clients working with the plant diagnostic lab. We've had uh, back um, previous uh, backyard farmer segments right. on how to send in a sample, and you can find that information on our website. These same ideas are true whether you take that sample to your local extension office or you send them into the diagnostic clinic here on campus. You know, our YouTube channel offers many great features and past shows you can watch anywhere on your phone, your tablet, or your computer. If you've got a question, chances are we've produced a video on it, or if you missed the show on Nebraska Public Media, it's posted on YouTube. So take a few minutes after the show to check out the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. All right, we're almost out of time. This is almost lightning. Your first question it has two or three pictures. A friend has these things swimming in her horse tank. What are they and will they harm the horses? So I just learned about this today. These are Daphnia. It's a freshwater crustacean and it won't harm the horses. But empty the tank. Yes. All right, there they are, one, two, three. <laughs> All right, uh, Terry, your first one is a carny viewer, wants to know how to stop. Oh, sorry, this is, I forgot this one. This is Columbine. Oh. For you, that yes. has aphids, aphids or something on, on there, it? spray yeah. it with a strong blast of the hose. All right, excellent. One or two pictures on that one. That's nasty. All right, so now, Terry, we come up with how to stop the sucker growth on this tree in Kearney. They want to know if Tordon can be used without damaging the primary tree. Uh, no, it'll kill anything that that root's touching. All right, your next one is a Gretna viewer. How to get rid of the purple flower in a new home. The backyard is overrun with it. Weed and feed didn't touch it and they don't want to <laughs> damage their pets. So this is Creeping Charlie. Uh, you need to take care of it uh, with a three-way broadleaf uh, weed killer in the fall. In the fall, all right. And your third one here is an Omaha viewer. What is the best method to remove this from the yard? It's been there since they moved in. Doesn't take over, but it is sporadic throughout, and it does have that white flower. This is a this is a violet. Um, it will uh, also be taken care of in the fall. <laughs> and a white one, not a violet one. Correct. All right, <laughs> Lauren. Uh, this one was actually sent directly to you. Lauren would appreciate this from Rural Bertrand. Found it on a broken cottonwood branch. And, and unfortunately, this one, I'm not exactly sure. I think it may be a Western jack-o'-lantern mushroom, but not exactly sure the way it's broken down. That's fun, though. And then a Nemaha viewer said our new home came with gifts. Are they poisonous <laughs> to pets? Um, I, with, with fungi, you always want to be careful with your pets. Uh, any of them can be toxic. That one in particular uh, looks like a uh, inky cap mushroom. So if that's the case, it will dissolve fairly quickly once it comes up and it'll break down quickly. But I would keep the pets out of them. They right. will stain too. All right, and your third one here is Waterloo. False morel. False uh, morel. Many times confused with the regular morel that people are finding right now. Uh, this one can be toxic, would not recommend eating it. I've Ooh. seen one that was five pounds in size one oh, time. So. Yeah. Pretty oh my awesome. goodness. This big. Yeah, oh my big. goodness. All right, <laughs> Elizabeth, picture. you have three pictures. This is um, somebody who got hot peppers, took a bite out of the ghost, <laughs> didn't finish it. He's grown all these cool things, but his question is will sweet bell peppers that have cross pollinated with hotter variations like Chinese capsaicin, will they get the fiery flavors of the first? You get what we call seedling variety, which means. Your guess is as good as mine. All right. And your final one is spots on veggies growing indoors. They've been growing these pepper plants inside. The weather has not been cooperating. These spots on the undersides and the leaves seem to be dying. What do we have going on here? That's just corky tissue called edema. So nothing to do, nothing to spray, and just let it go. 